wanting to say just thanks to everybody for joining. And it's we've had a little bit of a break here because I think last month was the July 4th holiday. Um, but we're going to get back on track here. And I think we were kind of at a natural point where a break was was good anyway, um, since we were getting to the end of the Caltrack 2.1 daily model. And we spent looking back on it. It looks like this is the ninth working group meeting. So we've spent essentially eight meetings talking about the daily model, but we've also had some fun digressions into EE weather. And we've talked a little bit about uh, data sufficiency given uh, delivered fuels context, things like that. Um, and so I'm just gonna start uh, sharing my screen and uh, we're gonna dive into the ninth meeting, um, which means we've been at this for um, the better part of a year now. So thanks to everybody who's sticking with us and this, and ho hopefully, you know, this this is actually going to get more interesting and more engaging as we go, um, because we're going to start diving into the hourly model, which I think there's a lot of fun to be had in the hourly model. So what are we going to talk about today? I uh, want to just uh, give a few notes on wrapping up Caltrack 2.1 and then uh, moving on to the hourly methods, and we're going to talk a little bit about Caltrack 2.0 and like what is Caltrack 2.0, um, why, what are the important limitations of Caltrack 2.0 right now, and what are the opportunities uh, with respect to an hourly model for a refreshed framework. And then as we've started to contemplate hourly modeling, um, we thought, you know, a good place to start would be uh, a re refreshed literature review. So the, the Caltrack 2.0 hourly model right now is, is essentially based on um, a, an article that was published that uh, had, you know, hourly modeling for demand response scenarios that was put out by LBNL. And we've, you know, the, the working group six years ago now modified that approach for more of an energy efficiency context. And I'll talk a little bit about the specific changes they made to it today. Um, but, you know, six years have passed and a lot has happened in six years and a lot of technolo technological advancements have happened and a lot of modeling techniques have come to the forefront. So we've dove in and, and asked ourselves what, what else is out there right now that we should be aware of and that we should be pulling from um, in order to, you know, modernize these methods. So, Wanted to start though on Caltrack 2.1 and just giving folks a sense of where we are and what to expect because the bow is not yet 100% fully tied on this thing. Um, but I wanted to share um, that, you know, at this point, we feel as though the model is fully specified. And now it's a matter of two things. Um, one is releasing all of the R&D results in a more formal way. And the second is getting the code in the open EE meter updated. And so anybody can actually start using and pulling from that repository. Uh, and we've been working with Steve Sufian from Watt Carbon and Ethan Goldman, um, just getting our feet on the ground. And, and they've been very kind to help us and, and think about volunteering um, to, to try to test out the new repository essentially, or, or the new um, the new version of Caltrack. So um, this is what this final model, model specification document and, and results, you know, we have a draft of this right now and I'm looking forward to just releasing this uh, to everybody um, in, in the working group and publicly. And, and essentially what you'll see is it has kind of a, a model, it has a summary section and uh, it's very short. And then it has a whole bunch of results. So we just have tabular results to show how 2.1 compares to 2.0. Um, we, we show that we're getting very, very you know, similar results uh, between the old Caltrack 2.0 code that used uh, extensive grid search um, versus the new Caltrack 2.0 of, uh, you know, we would call it, what do we call it? Caltrack 2.0 mode, but Caltrack 2.1 framework, um, where we're using this elastic net regression. Um, and this is this has made everything much faster with a, a, a global optimization scheme as well. So we're, we're able to show that, hey, you know, you can still use Caltrack 2.0 style modeling, which you may want to do, especially if you have monthly data, but you can do it a hundred times faster and cheaper 
um, and you're going to get, you know, across the population, essentially the, you know, the same results. Um, and then we just have a whole bunch of plots on seasonal bias and we have plots on, um, you know, error profiles that we're seeing from 2.0 compared to 2.1 um, for gas and electric. And then we have individual meter examples that you can see comparing again, 2.0 to 2.1. And a lot of this kind of thing, if you've been part of the working group is, you know, you've, you've seen these plots over and over at this point, but we have final versions of all of these plots and figures now. Um, along with final numbers. Um, and then and then last but not least, you know, we have the model specification. So for those of you who are familiar with how we've gone about trying to detail Caltrack uh, 2.0 um, and and 1.0 even before that, you know, there are these sections that are all delineated. Um, and we've done the same thing with uh, Caltrack 2.1. So we've done our very best to to lay out all of the steps that are followed and the equations that are uh, incorporated into into the modeling. Um, and Travis likes to make this point, and I will I will make it um, on on his behalf here, which is that you know really at this point. If you want to know exactly what the model is doing, the code is where you find that answer. Having said that, we of course need to do our very best to document in as much detail as we possibly can all of the steps that are being taken in the model framework, um, and we're we're doing that here. Um, so we're going to release this, and we're of course open to any feedback if if people want to dive into the details and read or have any questions um, uh, on the documentation. So that's where we're at. I would expect, you know, certainly before the next working group meeting, we're going to release all this information, and we're in the process of uh, updating the open EE meter code base to incorporate Caltrack 2.1 as well. So um, with that being said, let me see if there are any questions or comments on the Caltrack 2.1 stuff and wrapping that up and like where we're at and, and where we're going with it. Um, before I dive into, uh, before we really make a transition, which I, I think does mark like a real transition for this working group into the hourly model. Uh, as far as availability goes, uh, Caltrack 2.1 might be available shortly after the next meeting, based on how progress is uh, going right now. Thank you, Travis, and thank you to Jason Chulock, who is a senior engineer at Recurve, who's, who's really been leading the charge in taking the code bases that uh, Travis has set up and tested and, and starting to work them into the Open EE Meter software. Thank you uh, to both of you guys. And to, again, Steve Sufian, Ethan Goldman. Um, okay, so you know we're not too far away. We're maybe a month to six weeks away from actually being able to release the code publicly and, and having people start to use these methods. And we're super excited about that. I think it was a, a huge milestone. Um, so thanks to everybody, everybody who's, who has bared with us throughout the entire Caltrack 2.1 process. So, we can always come back to that. We don't have to close the doors. You know, we're not closing the doors forever on, on daily modeling by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I also expect that the topic of data sufficiency for delivered fuels is going to be a topic we're going to be coming back to um, even as we transition to Caltrack 3.0 here. Uh, also expect that demand response baselining, which I'm going to talk just briefly about today, is, is also a topic that that will be of interest to the group. So, um, Caltrack 2.0 hourly. Uh, let's let's you know. I, I think we did this for the daily model. I'm going to do something similar for the hourly model, and that is to explain what is the current state of Caltrack when it comes to the hourly model. Uh, and we'll talk about what the model is, what it does, how it operates, uh, what its limitations are, and then uh, where where we'd like to ultimately end up in a Caltrack 3.0 hourly model. Um, and again, as with any of these presentations or any of these working group meetings, just interrupt me if you have some questions. Right now, um, I'm on a laptop, so I can't see the chat. So if there are good questions that come in in the chat, Armin or Travis or, or somebody, please just interrupt me, let me know, and let's, let's uh, cycle through those questions. So first and foremost, just broad strokes, Caltrack 2.0 hourly, what, what is this model? Uh, it's what's called a time of week and temperature model where the variables uh, are hour of week and temperature. 
and there are 168 hours in a week. Um, and so the model produces a unique prediction for all 168 of those hours. So Tuesday at 7 p.m. gets a prediction, Sunday at 3 a.m. gets a prediction. And this, this makes intuitive sense because at every single hour of the week, you could imagine you have a different consumption pattern within a building. Certainly there are differences between weekends and weekdays. There may be even differences between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday kind of thing. Um, and, and so we're, by including the whole week and having this time of week, as opposed to like an, an hour of day in temperature model would miss things like weekend versus weekday effects. So I have plotted here just an average weekly load shape um, of a data set that we've recently studied electric, electric data. Um, and there's 168 hours in this week. Each of the peaks in this graph are, correspond to a day. So there's seven of those peaks. And, you know, if you squint hard enough, you can kind of see, I suspect, I think that uh, Sunday is the first day of the week, Saturday is the last day of the week. And you can see that, you know, there's a little bit of a, a pattern here that, that emerges. Um, but by and large, you know, most of these days are the same, but they're not identical by any stretch. Um, and, but, you know, one of the things, obviously, when we're talking about energy efficiency, and we're talking about longer term uh, savings measurement, um, you know, this average hour of week curve, uh, energy consumption over an, an average week is masking the fact that across the year, there are 12 months and there are very, very different consumption patterns that you observe from the winter to the shoulder season to the summer into the fall and then back into the winter. So, you know, if I look at July here, um, I get, you know, a, a pattern that's really peaking in the middle of the day and staying high through the evening and then kind of coming down. And there's, and it's very, very consistent. But if I look at January, um, you know, it's it's very different pattern where I get like a morning peak and then I get an evening peak and then I get a morning peak and an evening peak. Um, and the overall consumption doesn't peak nearly as high as it does in July when people are using a lot of air conditioning. Um, so by and large, we see um, that across populations, there are very, very different energy consumption patterns that occur throughout the year. So it's not enough for a model to simply uh, take like a time of week and temperature approach and average it over the entire year. Um, that was one of the things that in the LBNL model, because it was a demand response baseline, they didn't really have to worry about uh, the longer term changes that occur throughout the year. But in an energy efficiency context, we certainly do. Um, so we are in Caltrack 2.0, um, the, the working group, this was back in 2017, uh, said, okay, every single month, we're going to create a new hourly model. So June gets a model, July gets a model, August gets a model, and so forth. And But we're worried that if you only use data from that single month to produce a time of week and temperature model, where you have you know, not a lot of Tuesdays at 7 p.m., right? And in a single month, you might only have four Tuesdays at 7 p.m. That's not a lot of data to produce a, an, an estimation of uh, future energy consumption. We're going to also use the shoulder months. So for a, a July model, we're also going to use June and we're going to use August. But the decision was made, we're only going to weight those, those shoulder months by half. So the coefficients of the model end up uh, reflecting a full weighting on that central month that you're modeling. So in this in this uh, blue bar here, it's June, and then the coefficients are are uh, you know influenced to you know with half degree weighting on May and July. So each month gets an, a distinct model from this process, and then the annual Caltrack 2.0 hourly model is a stitching together of all of these individual monthly models that are that are produced. Um, now also, uh, you know, so this doesn't really talk about like how the model is, is really formulated, but temperature, as I mentioned, is a variable that feeds in, into the model. So um, what you need to know about temperature and how that works its way into the Caltrack 2.0 hourly model is there are up to seven distinct temperature bins. And the bins correspond anywhere from under 30 degrees all the way up to more than 90 degrees. 
And then the number of uh, the, these are each coefficients that that are possible for the model to incorporate. And these coefficients simply say, OK, on a, a 40 degree day, um, I'm essentially filling up the lowest bin. And so my coefficient on that term is going to be 30. And I uh, have up to 15 degrees in this bin. So I have 10 to 10 will be my coefficient. And then I have zero for the rest of them. Whereas a 80 degree day is going to fill up this bin. So I, I maximize, I max out that bin. So I have a, a coefficient of 30 that gets multiplied by a slope parameter. And then I have a coefficient of 15 maximizing this bin and so forth, maximizing each of these bins until I get to 75 to 90, where I only have five in that bin. And then there's more details around, um, you know, what happens if you don't have enough data points in any given bin? Like, what if you only have one data point in this bin or, or something like that to build the model off of? You end up collapsing bins and, and, and so forth. I'm not going to get into all those gory details because really we're not here to belabor everything that Caltrack 2.0 does. It's all documented. But I just want to give us a sense of what our starting point is, really. So along with and I'm going to come back to exactly how the model is formulated, but just keep this kind of matrix in mind of, of these temperature coefficients. Then we also have uh, an occupancy determination that happens in, um, in the Caltrack hourly model. So the way the occupancy determination happens is you take all 8,760 hours in a baseline year, and you regress on those hours using a Caltrack daily style model where you have cooling and heating and temperature independent regions. And we use a fixed heating and cooling balance points of 50 and 65 degrees. And then this equation basically is just that three piece linear model that we're probably used to looking at right now, where you have a temperature independent term, which is just an intercept term, and then a slope coefficient multiplied by heating degree hours and with a basis of, of 50 as the fixed balance point. And then similar for the cooling region where you have a 65 degree fixed balance point and a cooling coefficient and you have the error term. And so you, you do this regression and then you group the results by hour of week. So you say, okay, for every 7 p.m. on Tuesday, if my residuals are positive, for more than 65% of those 7 p.m. on Tuesdays, then I say, okay, that's an occupied hour. If not, then it's an unoccupied hour. So remember, this regression is agnostic to which, what is the hour of the week? You know, hour of week does not appear in this equation. So effectively, I'm saying, um, I'm going to take all the, the temperature and in consumption values for all 8760 hours agnostic to what the actual hour of day or hour of week is. And you can imagine a building that has uh, that's open from nine to five, then but is closed uh, the rest of the time. And maybe they're closed on the weekends. So I might look at Saturday at, at midnight or something like that. And Saturday at midnight, um, I'm going, this model is going to tend to over predict consumption because Saturday at midnight, the building is shut down. Um, so if I look then at all the Saturdays at midnight, chances are the vast majority of those data points are going to be over, the model is going to over predict consumption for the vast majority of those data points. So the residuals would be negative for the vast majority of data points and therefore that hour, Saturday at midnight, is classified as unoccupied. So we get, you know, say that office building or whatever, if the model's working as it should, you know, most of the hours in the middle of the day from nine to five when it's open get classified as occupied. Most of the, most of the hours when the building is closed get classified as unoccupied. And then we get that set of hours where every Saturday at midnight is classified as unoccupied, every 10 a.m. on Tuesday is classified as occupied. And then we take those, and this is kind of what that looks like. So again, agnostic to any uh, designation of like what the actual hour of week is. And this is the model that would get produced with that 50 degree and 65 degree balance point temperature. 
and I can see that I've got, you know, the model is, is clearly splitting the difference between two building states. And I have these hours where, you know, the, the residuals are positive, these hours where the residuals are negative. And so I wind up with effectively an occupied model and an unoccupied model. So everything that I talked about with these temperature bins, everything I talked about with the splitting of the model by month also um, includes a uh, splitting of each hour of week into an un unoccupied hour or an occupied hour. And so this is what the actual Caltrack 2.0 final model looks like after we've conducted that initial regression to determine occupied and unoccupied building states by hour of week. It consists of these four terms plus an error term. And you don't have to really worry about reading this equation. I'll just tell you that each of these terms kind of has an intuitive um, purpose. So this first term is the non-temperature dependent term that varies by hour of week. Um, this is a temperature dependent term that applies to all hours, regardless of occupancy state. So, and then the next two terms, I'll just point out for the moment, they include the occupied flag, which is just a one if it's occupied, a zero if it's unoccupied. So these terms go away if it's an unoccupied hour, or if it was determined, right, to be an unoccupied hour by the initial uh, fixed balance point regression. So the unoccupied model basically just consists of these two terms plus the error term. And so really the unoccupied model can be thought of as a, a, a term that varies by hour of week, um, but is not temperature dependent. So we might say, okay, the unoccupied building state, Saturday at midnight, the consumption, is, it tends to be X. Whereas, um, you know, Sunday at 5 p.m., maybe that's also an unoccupied hour, but it's a different hour of week, and the building is using energy differently at that time period. Um, that hour is also, uh, it gets its own prediction that depends on time of week. Um, then we have a temperature dependent term that applies to all hours. So we're saying, okay, now there's a term that is independent of actually the time of week. It can be Saturday at midnight, Sunday at 5 p.m. It can be Wednesday at, at 8 a.m., you know, Thursday at 6 p.m., e or any of the occupied hours as well. And that uh, there's a temperature dependence that we're capturing there. Um, then we have these terms that are part of the occupied model. Um, and again, it's separated into a non-temperature dependent term that is applied only to occupied hours and depends on time of week. Um, so maybe there's more, you know, more lighting that the building use, uses, or maybe the building, uh, you know, there's people cook lunch at noon or something like that. Um, and that those kinds of behaviors are, are not temperature dependent, but they're captured by this term. And then finally, there's a temperature dependent term that's applied only to the occupied hours. So potentially, you know, you have the building in a more um, human friendly, like comfortable, comfortable zone when it's occupied um, and versus when it's unoccupied. So there's a different temperature dependence that occurs during the occupied hours. And this is kind of the theory of, of these, these four components of the model and everything is intended to be captured by, by these terms. So if I just bucket these together, you know, we have this kind of like building base load always on consumption, regardless of whether it's occupied or unoccupied. Then we get this temperature dependent uh, during unoccupied, the temperature dependent usage that occurs during unoccupied hours. There's still some temperature dependence that can occur even if the building is unoccupied. And then there's additional temperature independent term, you know, that follows the occupied patterns of the building during those times of week that are occupied. And then there's an additional temperature dependent term um, during the occupied hours as well. Um, and, and that's these are kind of the four components of load that, that Caltrack hourly is intended to is intending to capture. So um, and then just as a reminder, you know, the annual model stitches together all of these independent models which are created uh, for each month of the year. 
Um, and that's really where I'm going to stop in just explaining like Caltrack 2.0 and kind of the structure of the Caltrack 2.0 model. There's a lot more detail that people can read online, but I just wanted to give a sense of like, what is Caltrack 2.0 before we start talking about what some of the important limitations are of this model. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, or Travis or, or Armin, or is there anything that's coming up in the chat that we should uh, we should address here? had a, um, a a question here adam and I, I don't know how much this is just semantics so i don't, I don't know if we want to um get too far into it but the way you've described it sounds like there's like more of these pieces sort of getting added together right that there's like a temperature independent there's there's two temperature dependent portions and the unoccupied one gets added to the occupied one or something like that and yeah. i just i think in my head i recalled like a 168 hour of week um load for you know sort of a base load for both one for the occupied and one for the unoccupied and then a, a temperature depends sort of you know bin slope model in the diagrams that i always remember like one for occupied one for unoccupied and it was less about them sort of getting added together and more just like there was this like each hour got got forked and so like either it got one our component and one temperature component added to it, or it got the other pair of those things added to it. I, I mean, I think that slightly different math, but I think you get to the same place either way. That's just sort of how I had it in my head is that there's like an hour and a temperature component and you you either got, you know, column A or column B. I don't know if it's important to like debate exactly how the code is implemented, but just putting that out there. You know, it's, it's a good it's a good question, Ethan. I will say that if this is, I mean, this is the equation that's published on the Caltrack 2.0 um, web or the Caltrack website. Yeah. And if this is the equation, then there is no occupancy flag within either of these terms, which to me certainly means that these terms are applied during both occupied and unoccupied hours. Yeah. Um, and I think that does inherently make sense. Um, because you can imagine different, you can certainly imagine that unoccupied hours, even though they're unoccupied, they're still temperature dependence, right? Like you want to keep the building at at least maybe 60 degrees. Otherwise, who knows, maybe you're going to have some problems with certain building systems or whatever, whatever it might be. So totally. there's energy consumption to like, that's needed to keep the building in a certain like minimal state. Um, you know, you could, you could think of that. Um, but then in the occupied time periods, then you have these other, you know, temperature dependencies to keep the building, you know, comfortable for humans or whatever. Um, and then in the uh, occupied hours, um, you also have a different sort of base load and that, but the, the base load is really reflective of, okay, now people are using lights and, and they're cooking or, or whatever it is. Whereas, you know, that, that there may be other kind of emergency lighting systems or things like that um, in the unoccupied hours that only need to come on at night or things like that. Right. So, yeah. Um, I think these buckets are intuitive, but you, your point stands that maybe this isn't, you know, if this is not the way it's actually implemented in the code, I have to, I have to admit, I haven't traced all of these equations, like all the way through the code. Um, so if this is like not the way that it's actually being implemented, then, then we certainly would need to update the, uh, <laughs> if anybody wants to do like a real homework exercise here <laughs> and tell us, are, is this really the way it's implemented in the code or not? Um, you know, I, I would give major kudos to anybody who, who would, you know, suffer through that. But um, that's my understanding of, of just reading this equation and interpreting it. And, and I, nothing in my understanding sort of differed fundamentally from what you're explaining in terms of like how all the, the concepts of what changes between occupied and unoccupied, how they both have some temperature dependent term, but some non temperature dependent term, like it's, it's all the same. It's just um, like, I was reading through all this and I was like, oh, interpreting those models sounds more complicated because I sort of need to think about the interaction between both of them. And so it's, it's just sort of a, a how you, you think about it. So it's, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it, it contradicts anything, what you're saying here. It's, it's just, uh, how, you know, how, how do people understand what comes out if you're actually looking at the coefficients, but I'm probably in the like, I'm actually like slacking with someone at the moment about how we can take these Caltrack hourly models apart, look at all the coefficients and then like manipulate them to understand different things and simulate different things. So I'm, 
probably in the, oh, yeah. the outlier yeah. group that actually cares what the numbers mean. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's like the the heating and cooling load disaggregation just kind of naturally falls out of Caltrack 2.0 daily, daily. Um, but with hourly, you kind of got to parse out these temperature coefficients and, and figure out, okay, where, you know, how are we going to do that? And we've, we've actually never gone through that exercise at Recurve. If somebody wants to do that, it would be, it would be pretty helpful. I would encourage people to publish that. Um, but I, yeah, I'm actually realizing, you know. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Sounds good, Ethan. Thanks. Um, I'm also realizing, uh, that I didn't even explain, um, like, so I mentioned that there are these up to seven distinct temperature bins that can happen in the unoccupied model and up to also up to seven that can happen in the in the uh, occupied model and this is how that gets implemented so the summation here is really a summation over these different um uh, coefficients that are that correspond to each of those seven distinct temperature bins so these coefficients are zero for the higher temperature bins, if it's a very cold hour, as an example. Um, but the coefficients like kick into gear if, or I'm sorry, these coefficients are zero. These beta terms are the effective slopes within each of those uh, temperature bins. So, you know, if you have a hundred degree day, then all of those, or if you have, if you have enough data to fill out each of those temperature bins, then you get a slope determined for for up to seven of those bins, and then this temp uh, then the temperature data point uh, says for any given hour, um, let's say I'm at sixty degrees, maybe I, I get into bin number five, then um, you know you sort of call upon these slope coefficients um, to and you multiply them by the temperature coefficients depending on the um, number of uh, or depending on the the degrees during that hour. Uh, in order to complete this this term, and that's what that summation is is really insinuating. And then there are different um, co there are different slopes for the occupied hours versus the the um, unoccupied. Um, okay, so what are some primary issues in in, in Caltrack 2.0? So first and foremost, um, the model is likely prone to overfitting, um, and you know. The, and, and I'll get a little bit more to, to kind of why that is. But there's obviously a lot going on in the model. There's a lot of potential coefficients and there's not a lot of data that it's being trained on when you when you parse it out into month by month by month. Um, the, and then second issue, DR baselines remain undefined. So really Caltrack hourly was built in 2017 by a lot of very smart people but we were really thinking about energy efficiency at that time we really weren't thinking about demand response so much um now we've used caltrack uh hourly for demand response and we've we've kind of modified it for that case where we're we're not doing this waiting between months and things like that and we're only focused on a shorter term baseline and it's worked pretty well um but you know we we still haven't like officially defined baselines and I know folks are very interested in this, and, and this is a missed opportunity um, to have uh, an open source and, and agreed upon standard for, for DR baselining. Um, then this is a big one, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about this for the next, if you stick with us in this working group, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about this next one. The model is incomplete for solar PV customers, really. So it's a time of week and temperature model, but if you have a solar customer, Temperature is one factor that may be influencing their energy consumption, but you better bet that if the sun is shining, you're going to, you know, it's, if it's a 70 degree day and the sun is shining versus a 70 degree cloudy day, the model is really not going to know what to do with, with those two, um, you know, sets of circumstances. It's going to make the same prediction, but it's obviously going to get one, both of them wrong. Um, and then finally, it's, it's unclear how readily the model is extensible to other technologies and programs beyond energy efficiency. So we obviously are making this huge transition around these demand side programs and we're needing to use them in different ways and we're needing them to be more integrated and holistic. And we have solar plus storage and EVs and all this other kind of stuff that we've got to start contemplating. And the Caltrack 2.0 hourly model was really mainly contemplated with energy efficiency in mind. Although you can still use it for things like, oh, a customer got solar PV. We want to measure the impact of that solar PV with a baseline and a reporting period. You can do those kinds of things. It serves those purposes very well. But 
when it comes to actually being able to model customers with those things in their baseline period, it's it's not clear how how well it should be expected to perform. Um, so let's just hit on these kind of one by one. So potential for overfitting. What do I what do I really mean by this? So take an occupied hour. So the model is then determined from a base load term, an additional non temperature dependent term, and then that's being done from effectively two months of data because you've got you know one month that's weighted fully and two shoulder months that are weighted by half so there's roughly nine data points that are that are really feeding in effectively nine data points that are feeding into these terms for each hour of the week and then you have up to 14 different parameters seven unoccupied and seven occupied that are that are dependent on temperature um and you know this is a lot of model parameters uh and and there's not a lot of data training these these model parameters so something that we spent a lot of time and effort developing in the caltrack 2.1 process was this cross validation so we always had a sense of whether or not um uh, we were at risk of overfitting the model and then in the final version of Caltrack 2.1, uh, we implemented this penalization uh, approach because cross-validation was very expensive, but we implemented a penalization approach that was meant to emulate what cross-validation would do. And that penalization ensured that in order to make the model more complex and add more parameters, you needed to have a, a, a mathematical uh, uh, justification for doing so that would that would ensure or or at least you know would give you a, a, a high degree of confidence that incorporating those additional terms would put the model from underfit to properly fit as opposed to properly fit to overfit. Um, and we've never really gone through that process in the in the hourly model. So uh, our suspicion is we're at pretty high risk of the model being uh, overfit. Um, moving on to the demand response use case. So what I'm actually showing is an example of where we've used Caltrack to measure demand response. We've modified Caltrack, and this was part of a study that Recurve did with uh, the CAISO um, to measure demand response. And it worked actually extremely well. We used also comparison groups to make this measurement. Um, but you know, we've never actually specified this in the Caltrack working group. Um, and I know that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of folks who are very interested in using these kinds of models for, for demand response. Um, and there's kind of the question of, well, can we, we have a lot of data already on this and we've, you know, used Caltrack with baseline periods that correspond to, you know, certain windows pre-program and things like that. And, um, if we can just specify what those are, there's there's actually a lot of information out there to already support those kinds of decisions. So if we can present that within the group and get some agreement there, we may be able to uh, have an easy win and then open this up for, for everybody's use. Um, but there are other aspects of demand response that we also should be paying attention to. So for example, um, in Caltrack 2.0, this occupancy flag is really not formulated with demand response in mind in 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 worst case scenarios it may cause real problems so you know we we really should be asking ourselves uh is there a better way to formulate a model that can serve both energy efficiency and demand response without without these kinds of things that might be very very difficult to understand exactly what their drawbacks might be when used in the demand response scenario um and as I mentioned about solar PV, um, the model is is unaware of critical variables. So, if you if you right now if you're using Caltrack 2.0, and you have a customer that has solar PV, and October 2022 is in the baseline period, and that's a cloudy month, but October 2023 is sunny, <laughs> then you're going to see huge false savings. And something like that actually occurred. Like this is a model that we created. And, and we're looking at observed versus the counterfactual. And this was like a really problematic meter, but nonetheless, this is a real meter where the counterfactual is clearly underestimating the amount of solar PV generation. Whereas if we actually had the right variables in the model, um, I think we'd be on much more solid ground. Um, 
We've also taken a look at median hourly error from a thousand meters um, in the residential space. And we've seen that non-solar uh, customers had an average hourly or a median hourly error of 0 0.41 kilowatt hours. Uh, whereas, you know, solar customers were more than double that at 0 0.98. So clearly the model is struggling with, with solar PV customers and, and there's risk associated with using the model for solar PV customers. Um, and then I'm about to wrap here and I'm going to hand the baton to Armin. Um, but when we take a step back and we also think about uh, what do we want to be using this model for, not just right now, this year, but in the next three, four, five years, um, you know, things are changing fast. And solar PV has been part of, you know, all of our lives for a long time. Um, and obviously solar PV is not a, like a new thing, but it's still growing exponentially. And it doesn't take a lot to find out, you know, you look up things like this, CBS News, number of Americans using solar power expected to more than triple by 2030. Um, you know, approximately 100 million households rely on rooftop solar by 2030. Um, home solar panel continues to rise, Pew Research Center, right? I mean, like these, these are just, this is just a fact of life that even though solar PV has been around for decades at this point, it's going to triple in the next decade. So we really have to start being able to like tackle this problem. And we can't just have a model that doesn't really perform well for solar PV customers. Like that's not an option going forward. Um, second, like we, when we talk about modern demand side programs, I mean, we're thinking about EVs, heat pumps, solar plus storage, load shifting. There's just all sorts of additional technologies and the combination of these technologies. So, you know, we're, we, we don't wanna be in a position where we're saying, okay, we've got a model that already is probably overfit. And now we're going to add solar variables into the model. And we're going to add variables associated with, with EVs. And we're going to add variables associated with battery storage. And we're going to add variables for this and add variables for that. Like that's exactly what we didn't want to do in Caltrack 2.1, because you're only going to make that overfitting go from somewhat of an issue to like highly problematic. And you're going to have a model that's not predictive at all. So. Um, one of the things we're asking ourselves is, can we get into a more flexible framework? And last but not least, of course, you know, I've already mentioned this, but EVs are going to be a huge factor. Um, you know, tons and tons of customers are going to be getting EVs and EVs, if, if a customer gets an EV in, in the residential sector, the average increase in electricity consumption is 30%. So, uh, we we need models that are a little more extensible to the kinds of things that are plugging in and and impacting meter data at people's homes or or businesses. Um, so as we're thinking about what do we where do we where do we need to go with the hourly model so that these methods can remain relevant um, and can help us facilitate the kinds of programs that we all want to encourage, right? We want to encourage building electrification. We want to encourage EV adoption. We want to encourage solar PV plus distributed storage. And we obviously want to con continue to support energy efficiency and demand response. Pretty soon, we're going to be in a situation where, you know, every customer kind of has their own unique thing going on. And it's not just that, oh, these customers got a new smart thermostat, but it's these customers are participating in a load shifting program and, and we've got, and they have a solar PV system and they're also participating in demand response via that smart thermostat. That's where we're going. So, and that's what, where we want to go. So our models need to be a little bit more adaptable and flexible to, to serve those kinds of integrated programs and purposes. So where we've really started on this journey toward new hourly methods is doing a literature review, because as I mentioned, the last time we dove into this question was 2017, and a lot has happened in six years. There's been a lot of advancements by very smart people in the academic communities and in industry, and there's been a lot of technological advancements um, by way of the types of uh, devices people can have in their home, how communicative they are to the grid, um, and the ways that they can be controlled. So uh, Armin, fortunately, has, um, you've met him before, but he's really taken the lead on this literature review. Um, and he's learned a lot because he studied many different kinds of types of models that have been developed in the last five years or, or even before that. And we think it'd be a great place to start this process by uh, talking about what we've learned from others 
Um, and if we don't have time to complete, you know, this this entire uh, literature review that Armin's done this time, we'll, we'll just continue it next time. Um, but with that, let me hand the baton to Armin. And before I do, let me just ask if anybody had any thoughts or questions on anything that I've covered to this point. Hey, Adam, Ethan, again, um, I, I want to 100% support all the stuff that you said about the importance of this and, and the challenges of matching, particularly on those peak days. Um, as an example, I'm working with utilities who are trying to forecast the capacity constraints on the grid, and they want to look at the electrification and efficiency measures alongside demand response and load control measures. And so it's really great. You know, I'm trying to use Caltrack to be able to put all that stuff on equal footing and say, this is what you can expect on the peak days. Um, and not to, you know, accuse you of cherry picking or anything on that that chart where you showed a really beautiful fit on that, that DR day. But one of the things that's concerned me a little bit is that on those peak days, right, like the, the one hour that they care the most about, I put up some charts for them of like, well, here's our, you know, reference data and here's what Caltrack models for that same weather year. And it does really well, except for like the hottest day, <laughs> the second hottest yeah. day in a row, right? So like not to jump immediately to the yeah. lag term discussion again, but I think that, you know, in addition to, and I totally support the solar modeling and some of these other factors, like bringing these in so that they're not like, bolt-ons afterwards if we're all doing similar things and make sure that they're like really incorporated in the model in, in you know consistent transparent ways but I think even just the you know underlying um, hourly model um, the place where it falls apart most is on those most extreme days and yeah. unfortunately that's the most important hour for some of these uh, utility clients so I don't know where you've prioritized that, but I just want to put a vote behind um, looking into making sure that we're um, hitting the peaks well as much as we hit all of the you know annuals and other um, factors. That's uh, a really good point, Ethan. So I, I just a really quick couple comments. Um, I can show you some really ugly counterfactuals, um, <laughs> and. Uh, so I, I think, you know, one of the things we said in Caltrack 2.1, if, if we go back to 2.1, just for a second, we said, look, this model has really high seasonal bias. And what we're typically doing now is we're using a comparison group and the comparison group experiences similar seasonal bias. So we're able to actually eliminate seasonal bias when we have a comparison group, but we don't want to rely on a comparison group for something that the model is performing very poorly at, right? And what you're describing is uh, nonlinear temperature dependence that occurs on really, really hot days. And we all know like that can happen. There, there's no reason to necessarily think that temperature dependence would be linear as you go from 95 to 105 to 115 degrees. Just ask Phoenix, right? Um, or that that's going to be the case uh, day after day after day if, if temperatures stay really, really hot. Um, so I think we're of the belief right now that having a comparison group is a best practice, but it's not a best practice to rely on that comparison group as we did in the KISO demand response study. The reason that counterfactual looks so good, and most of them actually do, is because of the comparison group. Um, it's not because of the underlying strength of the Caltrack model, but we don't want to rely on the comparison group for things that we could do better in the model, in the, in the, in the actual baseline model itself. So that's a really good call out. Um, any other thoughts or questions before I hand the baton to Armin here? Hey, Adam, this is Glenn, uh, pg and &E. um, Thanks for the presentation. Um, if this is too much detail, we can, uh, uh getting too far ahead. Uh, I'm just curious on the, on the final model that you had there where you're suppressing the intercept. Um, I re recall seeing that in the documentation and uh they never really explained why uh, the logic behind that do you by chance have any insights in that one a slide or two back? are you are you talking about this uh glenn i think it's uh a one or two slides previous yeah right there oh this one okay yeah that um, actually explicitly calls out to suppress the intercept and i just unless there's oh, some in the oh, data yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Good, good call. this is the way i would think about it glenn this term right here uh, along with this term is effect serves to establish an intercept basically because mm -hmm. it's basically saying like look the at it's just that there's a different intercept for every hour of the week so 
so like this inter this is basically the 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 intercept for uh Tuesday at you know 9 p.m. assuming that's an unoccupied hour then this term becomes the intercept huh. and then this term is the temperature dependent term for that hour huh okay and and so what we're saying is you know even if you remove temperature dependence and you have an unoccupied building state you know a, a, the, the, a good example in my mind is uh, you have emergency lighting within a commercial building and that emergency lighting doesn't necessarily maybe it's exterior lighting you don't really have to have it on during the daytime right. um, but at you know Tuesday 9 p.m um, you're going to have it on and so it effectively is and it's not temperature dependent right that that lighting is going to be on at 9 p.m every hour of every Tuesday at nine you know throughout the year um that this becomes that that intercept term for that hour okay okay that makes sense awesome thank you thank you, you. um armin would you would you like to share your screen um, yeah that would be yeah. great okay uh and like I said, if uh, if we don't get through all of what Armin has to present today, we'll just continue on next time because I don't want to shortchange the literature review. And I also didn't want to shortchange just getting into this topic of the hourly model. I think I think it's worth spending this time. So Armin, don't rush through this. We'll get to where you get and we'll have a little time for discussion and then we'll we'll continue on next time. Okay, sure. Let me just extract that tab, put it over here so I can see what's going on in the comment if there's any okay so thank you adam so uh right now i want to talk about a little bit uh, about the literature review on the hourly methods but mainly i want to focus on two different segments right now they may not be relevant but i'll uh, make sure that there, there is there is one slide that i connect these two together so the first set of uh, literature review is on uh, measurement and evaluation, M and V. Uh, basically, AMI or smart meter counterfactual uh, models. And the next part uh, would be solar disaggregation. And the solar disaggregation is basically highly linked uh, to the solutions um, and that I would suggest later on uh, in these uh, slides. Uh, was there any question? I can hear some. Okay. So uh, before we go to the MMV literature review, uh, I want to make sure that we know the difference exactly between the load prediction, MMV, DDR. So if you search for, uh, because I, I made kind of that mistake for a week, I searched for the uh, load forecasting and uh, when you read the load forecasting literature, you basically see there are two main um, parameters, two sets of parameters that they focus on. One is the primary variable, in our case, is energy consumption. And sorry, let me do this. Okay. Uh, it's um, uh, in the load forecasting. So uh, we have covariates. Basically, we have temperature, we have uh, all of the weather data. It can be solar data, time of the week, any uh, contextual variables that we have. And primary variable is the energy consumption. And these type of models, the load prediction, normally have a feedback loop of um, a window or a couple of time steps of the load feedback into the inputs of the model for the prediction of the future energy consumption. And normally in MMV, more specifically, I want to say in the, some interruptions like energy efficiency or more long-term uh, interruptions, uh, uh, not interruptions, sorry, the projects that we have, uh, we want to have a longer time period of a prediction. We have the baseline and we want to see what's going on in the reporting year. If we, if we have that feedback loop inside of our methodology, that can remove the impact of the actual project. So that, therefore that, that can be misleading. Uh, so in the MMV, basically we have a baseline period. We wanted to train the model on top of that, but we don't want it to overfit on that. So we have the solutions for that, as Adam mentioned, like uh, for example, cross-validation is one of the options that we have. We have an intervention and then after that we have the reporting 
period. And then we have the counterfactual based on the uh, baseline trained model and the uh, uh, reporting period data and the difference would be the saving. But generally, if we are talking about load forecasting or load prediction, that feedback loop may impact this saving in, in a way that we can uh, neglect the impact of the, of the project. And demand response is somehow in between of these two um, uh, categories, because like a demand response, we have a shorter period of time where we can use that feedback loop of the load variables to have a better prediction for those days that we don't have events. Uh, we, we can talk about that later, but uh, demand response somehow, uh, it's a gray area between these two. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that when you go a little bit deeper in the literature, uh, we can see in the MMV literature, we can see there are some of them are focused on the methodology and there are a bunch of uh, other papers, more specifically those uh, review papers that they're talking about the tools and softwares that we have for the MMV. Uh, that's, that's not our focus. That's why I put a, a link here. Uh, it, this is a reference of a literature review that actually talks about the tools and the industry application that they have. Most of them, they're, they're not uh, open source, uh, but you can uh, take a look at that. So our main focus is in methodology and how we can uh, find a better model and methodology for the open source and develop on top of that. Um, so inside of the MMV methodology, again, we have some model-based or um, uh, again, simulation based software they talk about how we can model or the, the or estimate the energy of the of the building based on the physical aspect of the building and this is basically a third um, it's not it's not practical in our case and uh, because we are we want to use the um, consumption uh, data or the smart meter data that we have uh, with the uh, uh, with a consumption driven models and inside of those data driven or consumption driven models uh, we generally we have three subcategories of the of the methodologies uh, statistical learning machine learning and ba uh, bayesian methods which each of them can be categorized in different <clears throat> methodologies but normally in the statistical learning, uh, as we can see, uh, we have linear regression, some other nonlinear regressions, uh, kernel regression, transfer function, uh, the current contract uh, hourly, uh, as we saw, uh, is based on linear regression. We have different beanings, uh, temperature beans, and, and different uh, inputs, but generally it's the, the, the main model that we use is linear regression. And the second category is uh, uh, machine learning. And we can see uh, more uh, recent literature focus on uh, these type of methodologies, which they include neural nets, uh, super vector machines, uh, random forest. And these are just um, samples of this category uh, that, I that I'm mentioning here. And Bayesian methods, uh, basically, uh, they are more um, based on a stochastic process, random process, and uh, probabilistic methodology. So Bayesian inference, Gaussian process, Gaussian uh, mixer models, or mixer regression, basically. Okay. Uh, so as like generally, as a rule of thumb, when we going from statistical methods towards uh, Bayesian methods, we have more deterministic towards probabilistic uh, methodology, but this is like general uh, methodologies that I see, I saw in, in the literature, but we can use Bayesian, uh, Bayesian methods inside of each uh, top categories, but normally they are, they are separated in, in the literature. Uh, so I just want to stop here to see if there's any question.
because I Should you elaborate science. a little bit on probabilistic versus deterministic? I mean, what are we what are we seeing here in these graphs? The red trace versus yeah. the blue trace. Mm -hmm. So basically, what do we see here is deterministic are those point estimate at each given time. Um, the best example that all of us know right now is Caltrack hourly. So for each time and each uh, each hour, basically, based on the temperature, based on the input data that we have, we have one output. We don't have multiple outputs. What in the uh, probabilistic uh, methodology, basically, we have a band or uh, the the prediction comes out with uncertainty uh, or a confidence interval, if you want to translate it. So basically, how confident we are, or what is there, for example, 95% confidence interval uh, for this specific prediction period of time. That's why we have um, like that transparent blue area that's actually showing the uh, uncertainty around that prediction. <clears throat> So um, for the rest of the uh, presentation, I want to bring some uh, couple of samples or kind of the best uh, representative of subclasses inside of each of those categories. For example, in statistical learning, we have multiple papers, but th this one that I brought, in my opinion, was kind of the candidate for all of those and the way they, they were approaching this problem. This uh, a reference that I have here, uh, reference number four, by the way, if, if you uh, wanted to uh, uh, go and search for these papers, you can click on it, and then the reference are uh, at the bottom of this um, presentation. So in this reference specifically, we're having a linear regression methodology in which the inputs are time of the week, outdoor temperature, so uh, close to what we have in the Caltrack hourly, uh, except the uh, except the temperature being uh, beans that we have. Uh, another difference is that instead of defining uh, occupied occupied and non occupied uh, period of the time, they use multiple features like feature engineering, which is based on the expert knowledge, and then they divide these two se segments to occupied load and non-occupied load, loads. And inside of each segment, they uh, like a scatter plot that you can see here with, uh, with a higher uh, relaxation uh, methodology compared to the, what we have in the, uh, in the Caltrack, which is a um, cooling degree, in temperature independent and heating degree. And uh, they're trying to fit a best uh, line or multiple lines through that temperature uh, versus the load. And as, as I said, this is so close to uh, what we have in the Caltrack. The problem with it is uh, still uh, we have the overfitting because I, I couldn't see any uh, train tests, cross validation, or any penalization for this methodology. And the model is simple enough that can. Um, uh, cannot predict or uh, fit to the structure that we want for the solar data, uh, solar customers or EV, um, EV customers. So basically, still we have the same problems that we have with the Caltrack. And personally, I'm I'm not a fan of occup uh, occupancy variables uh, either, Ethan, because uh, you, based on each residential there's no way you can say it's um, occupied or not occupied that's the term we use uh i rather to to the um, so just like leave it to the metal methodology to interpret it by itself by by its own uh, parameters that, that we define an external uh, features for it and uh, i want to switch to the next subcategory which which was machine learning again we have multiple uh, references here these are not all of the references that you can find outside but these are the best uh, in my opinion best uh, literature review in the specific uh, segment that we we're talking about but and i brought brought uh, i i want to mention one of them here which is based on uh, neural nets uh, again uh, instead of 
like defining occupancy or anything else, neural nets specifically let the whole model decide what is occupancy or not, or there's no definition of occupancy. So basically by, uh, if you can um, like imagine what uh, each of these neurons as a switch, if the load is low, they switch because they, if they can model the nonlinearity in the load, it basically can switch on and off by itself. And we don't need to define anything for it uh, for for the methodology. And the inputs would be for in, for this is specific example is contextual features again time of the week and all of those uh, that I mentioned temperature and the previous load. Uh, so they use previous load because uh, the context they were working on was demand response and it was a shorter period of time. So this that that's exactly that gray area that I mentioned it can be used and um, these uh, previous load can be used as a feature uh, but in the longer period of time like energy efficiency it's better not to use it to have to see to see the exact impact of the project i wanted to stop here a little bit and if there's any question In my opinion, um, machine learning methodologies are more promising in order to uh, unfold those patterns that are nonlinear inside of each individual smart meter data. We know in, in the individual level, uh, smart meter is highly uh, stochastic. Uh, that's why I think this is a, a promising a methodology uh, to invest in, or investigate in the future. Armin, what, uh, yeah. can you give us an example of just a contextual variable or a contextual feature? Like uh, what's, what, what have you seen successfully implemented or when something, or if you haven't seen something, then what's just an example we should be latching onto? The normal or the most common uh, used features are time of the day, time of the week, month of the year, and weekend and weekday flag, holiday flag, uh, these are the most five common uh, contextual features that uh, I saw them when people were using. And so, so effectively, it's it's kind of a similar set of inputs into the model as what Caltrack 2.0 is receiving, but the uh, but the modeling approach itself doesn't isn't so prescriptive. It's it's basically like let the neural net kind of figure out how to can take each of those pieces of information and weight it appropriately. Yeah, for example, that's actually a really good uh, example. For example, those 12 months of 12 months different models that we had, instead of that, we can actually have a vector, one hot vector of, we know each time that we, we want to explore has a month inside of one of the months. So for that specific one, we have a vector of uh for 12 the, the size of 12 and one of them would be one the, the rest of them would be zero which we call them one hot vector and then based on the batches of the data we train the neural net those weights inside of neural net decide which portion of other models inside of other months can impact the current month or the current value that we have so, and we know that's definitely different from uh, house to house. That's why I think half of the month from previous and half of the half of the uh, model from the uh, next month um, combination to the current month may be not appropriate for all of the customers. Maybe for the majority is uh, is good to use that, but it's better the model to decide what what are the weights rather than we kind of intentionally guide the model or methodology goes towards that, uh, the way that we predefined for it. Now, okay, that's that's helpful. And when we say, when we're looking at temperature here, I just, I'm like, what's bouncing around in my head is something Ethan said earlier about, there's still this issue of thermal lag or thermal inertia. Mm -hmm. uh, you have three really hot days in a row. Right now, if for us to kind of tackle that, we have to 
prescribe a rigorous methodology for how how that gets executed um, in a more traditional modeling approach. And with with something like this, is it does it kind of pay attention to that naturally? How should yeah. we think about that? Yeah. So actually, I wrote it down here. So big like time series, as Adrian mentioned. Uh, basically, instead of like looking at the prediction in a time slide point of view, each point indiv individually is an input, and then we have one output for it. With the neural net, we can actually introduce a time series of different features like temperature, solar time series, or anything else and then append the contextual features uh, at some like uh, point of that neural net and then predict the time series of the methodology for example we input uh, a day or two of the temperature and a day or two of humidity for example these two features that are available and then based on the neural net we predict the next 24 hours of the smart meter data. So basically, if there is any correlation inside of the inside of the input feature based on the time, the, the, the lag or lead of the temperature with the output of the uh, smart meter data or the methodology, we can see that. And the weights of the methodology should be able to uh, unfold those patterns. Is there anything then, Armin, that you, how does, how do you avoid overfitting when using this kind of an approach? I mean, the, what we did in CalFRAC 2.1, which, uh, you know, we weren't using a deep learning approach in CalTrack 2.1, we used this cross-validation scheme and we paid like really close attention. Are, do you use similar kinds of test train uh, methodologies within neural net yeah. development or, yeah, you do, yeah. So yeah. the base thing about neural net is basically you have to use train tests. Like otherwise, hundred percent you get overfit because you have lots of uh, parameters here, way more than what we have in. We can easily uh, overfit easily, and maybe not maybe hundred percent. We can uh, make the error zero if we wanted to push it as hard as we want. But basically, cross validation uh, definitely uh, will be used. And then penalization is a is a main part of it. So we penalize. One example is the uh, the actual size of the weights or the parameters inside of neural nets inside of the loss function. So uh, mm, the weights cannot diverge or be as uh, whatever they want. So we penalize them or restrict or limit them uh, uh, the parameters to be in a, in a certain area so we can remove the overfitting. And at the same time, we can use other techniques like dropouts. R inside of the training, randomly, you select a couple, of, for example, 20% of the neurons, put them aside or free, uh, freeze their uh, parameters, train the other, uh, other uh, parameters, and then do that randomly for the next batch of the data or next epoch of the data. That showed that th these type of things that actually can prevent overfitting. Uh, Glenn, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this might be related to the question you kind of asked uh, a little bit, uh, maybe a little higher level. Uh, I was just wondering in your uh, literature review that did you find any, do you have any thoughts on the pros and cons versus um, machine learning methods versus um, a model specification? Uh, you know, the machine learning doesn't really have a model specification. So it seems like if something goes wrong in your prediction, it'd be less, less transparent uh, what happened in that, uh, in that particular scenario. Yeah. Does that make sense there? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. So basically the main problem that we can mention is like interpretability with the machine learning methodology. But as we could see in the current Caltrack model, I don't think it's easy to kind of, kind of interpret the model but as, as it is right now. But in the neural net, the, the, 
bec the the reason we are penalizing the the weights or uh, the random dropouts or cross validation all of those things we're trying to limit the model to stay to just extract or unfold the patterns of the time series or just uh, the nonlinear relationship between input the output features just uh, extract those patterns rather than fit perfectly and then by somehow uh, randomizing the initial inputs and uh, fix the random seed you actually can replicate the result many many times as much as you you want so it's not like based on random we train it once and then the next time we, we will get another result basically the result would be fixed uh, as, uh, as long as you limit the uh, methodology but rather than that uh, in any other aspect uh, neural nets show the better result even in, in the computational uh, speed based on the GPU learning and all of those um, parallel computing that we can have. Yeah, I'm going to add to that really quick, and then I, I think Travis uh, has some thoughts as well. But I think it's a really good question, and this is like kind of at the heart of um, of our working group. And if you can look at the Caltrack 2.0 hourly model as an example, and you can say, you know, theoretically, I could back out a model prediction and understand exactly what impact each of the you know 14 different temperature bins. Um, or temperature slopes had uh, within the model for an occupied hour, um, understand those intercept terms, th things like that. That's theoretically possible. I can say that, you know, we've worked with the Caltrack hourly model for six years now. I don't know of a single instance where we've ever done that. <laughs> um, and I, I, I would also say that the important thing in my mind no matter what model you're developing is to test it on large data sets so you have confirmation that you know repeated confirmation that you have reliable outputs and and you're testing uh with data sets where you have known answers um and and that that i think is a is a really critical thing and if you have that kind of an approach and you can test the any method on, on many thousands of meters and you can show that you're getting what you would expect out of a prediction, um, then I think it sort of becomes less important whether or not uh, you could back out uh, like specific coefficients and things like that. And then I guess the last thing I would say is Neural network approaches are not magic. I mean, there are definitive, there's definitive math that's going on and it's it's well established. Um, so you, while you can't necessarily trace back um, like to more, inter you can't interpret necessarily like what each neuron is paying attention to exactly. Um, it is actual math that's going on. It's not, it's not, um, it's not beyond the world of, <laughs> of mathematics in any kind of way. Um, Travis, what, you know, I think you probably have some thoughts as well. So mine was going back to a bit of the conversation that was having, happening in the messages. And um, one of the things that people were interested in is, well, which is the best time series uh, contextual feature to pick? And I was going to ask you, Armin, if you could uh, expound upon uh, the flexibility of these methods as far as which of these uh, uh, properties that you pick, as well as the number of properties that you can input to be trained on. Travis, I, I don't know if that was my internet or not, but I lost like good chunk of the question, sorry. Yeah, it's just my internet. Uh, that's why I had to turn my video off. Um, can you talk a little bit about the which properties as far as uh, air temperature goes or uh, wet or dry bulb, uh, which of these we can use, does that matter? And how many of these different properties can we use in a machine learning? Um, it basically, model? it's open as, as much, even within different projects or even within different uh 
each individual smart meter, you can change the input. Um, it, it's it's not that hard to let the um, input to be open based on the uh, use cases that we have. So uh, you can add temperature, humidity, solar data, wind speed. Actually, believe it or not, wind speed is a really important uh, predictive input for the smart meter data. Sometimes even it's more important than temperature. Uh, there's a high correlation. I, I seen, I've seen in data, there's a high correlation between uh, wind speed and the output in many uh, residential data. So uh, you can have these features, even all of the time series stack on top of each other and have a control on the weights of the neural nets in a way that have a predictive model and fit enough, not overfit, not underfit. Uh, for the, for the specific for the neural net, we can actually add them on. Um, I, I want to add a little bit on on top of um, your question. If we even if we add one more features to the current Caltrack methodology, which is solar, uh, then uh, which is kind of I, I'm pretty sure it's necessary for solar customers. After all of this literature review that I did, I, I don't know if we can finish it today or not. But I'm pretty sure we need to incorporate solar information inside of this methodology. If even if we add just one extra feature, which is solar data, to the current Caltrack, the whole model again it can be interpretable as it is right now because we don't have the temperature independent. Because then the solar will kick in, and we have covariates, and we have. Uh, um, uh, um, parameters related to the solar and you can distinguish the impact of that and temperature so that that would be make make the car even current caltrack uh complex enough that uh neural networks should be like basically within the same complexity so you're saying just to tie just to say that uh, in my own words you're you're saying like look if we incorporate solar irradiance data uh, as a variable into the Caltrack 2.0 model, if we just kind of did that thought experiment, then there is a correlation already between temperature and solar irradiance, which kind of makes sense. It's going to be warmer, generally speaking, at noon when the sun is shining than it is going to be at, you know, 11 p.m. when the sun is down. Um, that you, because you have uh, co-variability between the temperature uh, and the solar irradiance, you are already creating a situation where you can't parse those things out very well, um, even in a traditional model. So, um, okay, this is this is good. Armin, we have four minutes left, and I'm not at all surprised or disappointed that we didn't get through everything. Do you think there's a good stopping point that we can get to uh, before the next, uh, maybe introduce the Bayesian methods and then are we all yeah. more- to yeah. This Bayesian? one and the next one would be this, this is just the last- uh, Perfect, let's get through these but, and then the next time yeah. we'll save the solar PV disaggregation, which will be a perfect topic for the, for the next uh, working group meeting as well. Yeah, sure. So another group of uh, methodologies where Bayesian met methods they are based on random um, variables. They're a probabilistic methodology. Basically, uh, before uh, all of those two uh, last segments, we had those weights that we had, those parameters were deterministic. But right now, imagine each of those weights, they have a mu and sigma if, if we consider them as a Gaussian and PDF. So basically, instead of uh, optimizing parameters, by itself, we are optimizing a probability distribution function of each weight. So all in all, we have a prior knowledge about the parameters, that's a, that's an assumption. And we use Bayes' rule to update the posterior, which means we update the methodology, we, we input the data, and we update the whole uh, model that we have based on the given data that we have. And uh, but in terms of input, again, we can have contextual features, temperature, anything else. The random part of these type of models is inside of the model itself, not, not inside of the uh, inputs. So basically, instead of having one point of estimate, which normally we have uh, one 
data point prediction for one um, target uh, uh, parameter. And now we have uh, kind of a band or confidence interval prediction. And this is for one, one user. And as we add more users, like 10 users aggregate together, we have less uncertainty. And then and when it goes to the population level, we, we like for example here, a thousand users, we, as we can see, we have a very um, correct uh, prediction and very small uh, uncertainty band. So that's the main difference between probabilistic methodology and deterministic. That would be the last one that can connect to that, or I can just stop here. Yeah, let, let's stop here. And I think okay. uh, um, this is a good place to stop, actually, because we've, thanks to Armin here, have outlined a whole bunch of different kinds of modeling approaches that operate on hourly energy data, um, all the way from forecasting methods to baseline and counterfactual you know, use cases and the kinds of models that Armin has seen in the literature do differ uh, depending on the needs of the use case. And we're definitely more in that baseline and counterfactual uh, type of approach where you can't just continually use the most uh, up-to-date data to predict tomorrow's consumption because what we're trying to measure is the impact of an intervention that might've happened months ago, for example. So. But there are things to learn from the way that people do some of these forecasting exercises. Um, and we've also seen a whole bunch more literature on machine learning methods in the last three or four years than was the case in 2017 when the Caltrack 2.0 model was being developed. So there's a lot to chew on there. There are many, many groups that are trending in that direction. It's not necessarily where we'll want to end up as a working group. And I think we're open to, to feedback on that. Um, but I think we're thinking about Caltrack 3.0 as a modeling framework that we want to be more extensible to more kinds of integrated programs. Um, and we are also aware that the drivers of energy consumption certainly go well beyond uh, temperature and hour of week. Um, and so we're thinking about ways that we can approach this problem, keeping overfitting in mind um, and, and so we're looking at what are the possibilities to have the right data in the model to represent the right customer consumption patterns. And some customers are going to have dramatic consumption changes when there's solar PV. Some are going to have dramatic consumption changes when there's an EV. And what's a modeling framework that can allow us to put all of those things potentially under one umbrella in a more extensible way? Uh, that's kind of just what we're grappling with as we just get our feet on the ground. So I'll end by saying there's a lot of really smart people in this group, and you're probably aware of other papers or other approaches that have been taken, or maybe you yourself have investigated uh, something with hourly modeling that you'd want to draw our attention to. Please let us know, um, because we're going to be doing a lot of designing, a lot of testing. Uh, and we're going to be pulling from what we've seen and work in the literature that is most aligned with our specific use cases. But I will say, I don't think that there's anything we've seen in the literature that's a direct like solution to what we're trying to do. So there's going to be new methods that come out of this process. Um, and so we're going to learn everything we can learn and we're going to, you know, absorb all the smarts and wisdom from folks who dove in and made all the mistakes already. And then we're going to make our own mistakes on top of it. So, um, Armin, thank you so much for the presentation today and thanks everyone for, for coming and we'll continue on next time diving in specifically to some of what we've seen with methods that are specific to solar PV disaggregation, which is going to be also a goal of uh, the Caltrack 3.0 model that just kind of naturally uh, naturally comes along for the ride. Um, so thanks everyone. And we'll reach out with more information about next time. And uh, in the interim, I think we'll be releasing the Caltrack 2.1 specification and results. So keep your eyes out for that as well. Uh, so we'll talk uh, a month from now. Thanks everyone, talk soon.